We are on lecture two of week five, still dealing with autonomous systems. Last week we talked about uh, autonomous cars and then some more general arguments about what counts as autonomy and what sort of autonomy we might want. Um, this article by Amoroso and Tamburini focuses on autonomous weapons systems. Um, yeah, he ultimately is going to argue, um, he wants to construct some sort of argument against autonomous weapon systems in general, um, because as we'll see, he reviews various arguments against them and he finds that they're not um, all very convincing or they're not all sort of broad enough. So he wants to construct an ethical argument that's a sort of a blanket ban on autonomous weapon systems altogether. Now, you may disagree with him. You may want to write a paper disagreeing with him, right? But this is his stance, their stance. So what do I mean by an autonomous weapon system? So uh, there's a couple ways of defining them, actually, but we can start by saying it's, it's a, a weapon system that performs the functions of target selection and engagement. Engagement, we mean like, you know, shooting, um, without any intervention by human operators. So like a drone wouldn't count as an autonomous weapon system if there's a human that's directing every move of the drone, right? These are systems that will find their target and, and shoot at them uh, without any involvement with humans whatsoever, unless the humans are the targets. Um, now, whether and how to regulate the use of these sort of systems is a, is a matter of concern for the UN, various NGOs, and sort of like international, you know, what, what international organizations we have that have any control at all over this sort of thing. Uh, some want to try to work to ban autonomous weapon systems outright. Others want to at least um, exert, make sure there's some level of meaningful human control over such systems that exist. Usually the focus is on lethal AWSs, but you could imagine similar problems uh, with AWSs that just target sort of, you know, weapons factories. So the way that these authors are going to approach this problem is um, they're going to keep in mind these two, just the two main really approaches that you tend to see ethics, and we've discussed them in this course. I think you should be familiar with them at this point, right? Um, utilitarianism, which is associated with Mill, and deontology associated with Kant. So um, deontological arguments, which again are rule-based arguments, they say there are certain right duties sort of obligations and certain rights you have that cannot be violated, right, for um, ends do not justify the meat, right? For it doesn't matter what the end is, there are certain things that you cannot do. Um, so in the context of AWSs, uh, they'll usually argue that they violate one or more moral obligations or rights held by some of the agents involved. So there's maybe there's certain things that military personnel should never be allowed to do, or there's certain things that should never be done to right, people who might be the, the targets of these AWSs. Um, whereas consequentialist arguments tend to focus on, you know, the very, basically the downside, right? They're gonna add up the, the pros and cons and they'll argue there's more cons uh, to these sorts of systems than pros. Um, these consequentialist arguments are a little bit harder to use if, you're, if your goal is a blanket ban on AWSs because um, there are lots of conceivable situations where things are going to add up, the pros are going to be heavier than the cons, and you're going to say, maybe we should use AWS. Um, we'll get into those in, uh, if you're having trouble conceiving of that. Um, so, but the plan here is a sort of a hybrid approach that unifies deontological and consequentialist arguments and sort of uh, merges them together to try to form a blanket argument against all AWSs. So, in order to understand what we're trying to ban or what we're trying to argue against, uh, we need to know what an autonomous, autonomous weapon system is. There's, uh, they discuss sort of two approaches, one's associated with the UK and one associated with the US. Um, the one in the UK is pitched pretty high, it's sort of demanding, and actually very few current systems seem to qualify under that definition. So the definition is that an autonomous weapon system understands higher level intent and direction, right? Meaning that uh, the system should be able to formulate its own goals and then execute actions uh, in order to achieve those goals. That's pretty intelligent. 
uh, we don't, it's not clear that we have those systems yet, although we might. Um, but the you might want to say there's systems that don't meet that level that we, we might still want to ban, right? So the U.S. Department of Defense has a lower bar. They define AWS as any system that can, once activated, select and engage targets without further invention, intervention by a human operator. Uh, I think this, is the, this tends to be the more popular one. Um, you might need to adjust it given certain contexts, but the lower bar is useful here for, um, for these authors who want to ban more of these, right? So th it includes more things, it's more thing. If you can argue against it, then that's more things that are covered by the blanket ban. So just from some examples, there are, these exist, right? Um, at least as defined by the Department of Defense, this lower bar system, right? So we have the Israeli Iron Dome, German Mantis, South Korean Super Aegis II, uh, Brimstone is a British system. So the Iron Dome uh, is an Israel, Israeli system and it detects incoming rockets, right? And automatically shoots them down. Not unlike the Star Wars system. I don't know if you, uh, familiar with that. That's a long time ago now. Reagan in, in the 80s were trying to figure out. But yeah, if your enemy is shooting rockets at you, you shoot other rockets to blow up those rockets, right? And and the, so the system is able to detect the rockets, launch your own rockets, and intercept them without any human intervention. Uh, it has a manual override, but you don't really want to engage that because um, the stuff happens really fast and the computer's better than the humans at finding these. So you kind of wouldn't want a human at the wheel um, when, when the shooting starts, right? You want the computer in there uh, because it's much faster. Uh, Brimstone is a British system. So this is sort of like a tank basically, right? Um, it fires missiles though at tanks, but it, yeah, it, it moves, right? Um, but it sort of moves autonomously and locates its targets and fires missiles. Um, so it can't, it can go into a fire and forget mode where the humans sort of say, here's the general area where we're looking for enemy and the system itself will drive around, find the targets, shoot them. And then finally, another sort of concrete example is the South Korean uh, at the border with North Korea. It's Super Aegis II, and it's basically a machine gun on a turret, but it can detect right, people in the objects or humans in the demilitarized zone, and right, uh, it can fire at them or not. Right, it's up to it's up to the system whether to do it. This here is the, um, the um, so despite many differences, you know, some of them are defensive, right? The, the Israeli one is defensive. This uh, British one is a bit more offensive. It might be mobile like the British one. It might be stationary like the, the Korean one. Uh, and the nature of the target differs. Is it a tank? Is it a person? Is it another missile? Um, and likewise, the algorithms, right, that you have to write to, to make these work will differ greatly. But all of these qualify as autonomous weapon systems by that Department of Defense U.S. definition. Um, now, you might worry that that's a problem, right, for this definition, at least because it seems that some of this, right, it doesn't seem super problematic to want to blow up rockets that are being shot at you, right? You're not hurting a person. It's totally defensive. Um, whereas the automated machine gun system, right, that just Blast that right that mows down people that just happen to be in the demilitarized zone, that could be more ethically worrisome, right? How how did they get there? Are they at fault? So um, for better or for worse, right? We've lumped a bunch of stuff into one category. But again, this serves the author's goal because they want a broad an argument that has broader implications. Okay, so a couple there's a couple different terms to get thrown around, and one is autonomy, another is meaningful human control. So um, they're sort of in tension with each other. So if it, it might be possible to have both an autonomous vehicle that also has some degree of meaningful human control over it. Um, but you can also see how these are sort of, right, we, uh, the more autonomous, the less humans are involved. And yet ethical considerations will push towards more human involvement. Um, and depending on how you define both these terms, you're going to have differences in whether certain systems count as being autonomous or having enough meaningful human control over them and so on. <coughs> and then, anyways, at least these authors say the meaningful human control stipulations are already in there. They're already in the international law. Um, we don't really need to do much work on that front. 
but what is sort of up for grabs still is a sort of some sort of blanket ban on AWSs. So that's going to be primarily their focus. So now they're going to discuss sort of separately the deontological arguments against AWSs and then the consequentialist ones, point out their flaws, and then again try to at the end unify them into a better argument. So uh, one deontological principle that you might invoke is that AWSs can't comply with inter international rules on lethal use of force, right? So um, the international law says you, there's only certain types of people you can target, right? You can't target innocent civilians. And the worry is that the AWSs right now can't make those distinctions, right? They can't tell if you are a, um, a soldier or right, a person wearing green or something like that, right? They, they can certainly get confused. Um, apparently they have trouble distinguishing like a sleeping dog from a bush, right? So they're just not that sophisticated yet to make those kind of distinctions that are required by international law. Now, of course, um, also, right, human soldiers are required to make certain calculations, right? So any, a soldier in the field is not just like blow up everything in my path, right? They're making these calculations of like, okay, if this target is important, right? We want to take it out, but there is a potential, some percentage of collateral damage where innocent people get hurt. Um, how valuable is the target versus how likely is the collateral damage? And, and they have to make these calculations all the time whether to do stuff. Um, and the argument, right, is that, at least the deontological argument is that um, these sorts of decisions require particularly human traits, like this sort of emotional intelligence, social knowledge, things like that. And then even after the soldier in the field has made this sort of calculation, you still have to go through the commander and the commander might still want to be even more cautious, right? Because now they have to decide whether to place their troops in a situation where they have to kill innocent people and deal with all the potential effects on those soldiers' mental health and general morale, right? So there's lots of very subtle and you might think very human sorts of calculations that have to happen. Um, and the worry is AI just can't do this stuff. Right. And at least now and even in the near future. Um, so delegating these sorts of, again, very human weighted emotional decisions um, to machines would be sort of in violation of the obligations of commanders currently stand by international law. OK, another deontological principle um, using these AWSs may create an accountability gap. So um, they make mistakes, right? They, they will. Almost certainly you employ an AWS. Um, at some point it will right, kill someone, kill an innocent person, right? So to humans, it's war. Um, but the sorts of errors that they make will likely be very different from the sorts that humans make. They're really very different systems. And they're, we've seen that they have trouble sort of like uh, mimicking human perceptual systems, human decision-making systems. So they might make decisions that are technically war crimes, right? Um, okay, if so, whose fault is that? Um, they're going to assume, these authors assume that the weapon system itself is not a moral agent, right? So that's not going to be responsible, it's not going to be satisfying at all to imprison, right, a, uh, a computer or an algorithm for making this sort of mistake. Um, of course, there are other candidates for who gets the blame. Um, could be the software programmer, could be the commander that makes the orders, right, to deploy the AWS. Could be the soldier on the ground that's operating and overseeing the AWS. Could be the people that developed it, political leaders, President Biden, right? Um, so we have what we call many hands problem. There's lots of candidates for the accountable party in the event that an AWS right, does something that violates international or moral law. Um, but we just don't really have a good reason to pick one over the other. Um, you know, sometimes you can maybe able to. It's not that in every case we would have an accountability gap, but uh, there certainly seems like there's likely to be situations where it's impossible, um, which is just the, the result of the, again, the opacity of the AWS's decision-making ability. And what that means is just they're, because of the way we have to program these computers to be anywhere near human-like, um, you know, if, if anyone's familiar with like sort of deep learning or these machine learning algorithms, the, the way they learn is not sort of explicit rules. And so when they make a mistake, it's hard to look at the programming and see why exactly, right? And make sense of it. Because usually when something terrible happens, 
we want to know why we want to find the reasons and, and it's just not probably going to be possible when there's AWS's in there. mentality is in many ways very different from ours. Now you might say, hey, the choice is easy, right? The commander is always responsible or whatever, the soldier in charge of the AWS is always responsible. But the problem is the AWS is, if it's really autonomous, then that's sort of by definition, it means it's not under anyone's commands. It's making its own decisions. And really the reason sometimes we want to employ these sorts of systems is because their reaction times can be so much faster than ours, right? But the very fact that the reaction times are so fast means that even if I, in my, I deploy the AWS and I really want to intervene to stop it from doing this war crime, I wouldn't be able to, right? I wouldn't be fast enough. So um, yeah, the worry is if no responsible party can be located, um, then who goes to trial for war crimes, right? I forget which Nazi this is, but this is a Nazi right under on trial. Um, there was a, I watched a film recently about this. Eichmann, I think it's Eichmann, yeah. All right, another deontological principle that you may consider. Um, you might say, well, look, the AWS's lethal decision-making runs counter to human dignity. So there are principles, and this is also encoded in international law, that suggest that allowing machines to make life and death decisions might be repugnant to human dignity. So there's this sort of intuitive claim, and it, you can support it by two different principles. And, and one relies on sort of the agent-centered centers, agent -centered duties, right? The person doing the killing, what, what are their duties to the person and that they're killing? And then on patient-centered rights, what are the rights of people, right, who are being attacked by soldiers? Um, so the agent center argument says, uh, Taking a life, you can, you're only allowed to take a life, and it's only ever justifiable if it's not arbitrary. And to be arbitrary means to be based on a considered, well-reasoned decision which takes into account the value of the life and the significance of its loss, right? So, um, again, as we mentioned, right, soldiers, they don't just, they're not just blind killing machines, right? When they go into a tactical situation, they have to think about what is, the, again, what is the value of the target, um, what is the likelihood of collateral damage, and then what is the particular situation I'm in, right? Um, maybe I would shoot a grown man in order to achieve an objective, but maybe I wouldn't shoot a child, right? Even if the objective is really great, um, maybe there's something in particular about even the man that I, that it would change my ride. Um, and, and again, it seems like machines are just incapable of making these sorts of decisions about sort of the, the value of a particular life, right? Vis-a-vis -vis these large other objectives. Um, and if machines are just incapable of killing in a non-arbitrary way by this definition, then any killing by a machine would be unjustified. Now the patient-centered version of this um, says, again, you have a right not to be killed arbitrarily or extrajudicially, right? Um, you can't, the reason that right things like the the My Lai massacre, where sort of women and children were just killed indiscriminately, um, why that's a war crime and why that's wrong, is um, not only do the soldiers have an obligation not to do that sort of thing, not to do that sort of arbitrary thing, but also right civilians have a right not to be killed without some sort of trial or right some some sort of judicial procedure um, that, that shows that the killing is moral or justified. So the idea behind this is each person is a unique human being. It needs to be recognized. And the argument is machines just can't. Um, you can't make an appeal to the humanity of the machine, right? Say, no, no, listen, listen, right? Don't shoot. This is a unique situation. Let me convince you. You can't really do that to a machine. Um, all these factors would be programmed in advance. And so just wouldn't recognize the uniqueness of each particular situation and the moral considerations um, that obtain. So those are some deontological arguments and they might seem convincing to you, um, but there are sort of general problems with all of these, right? They all sort of rely on the ways in which these AWSs aren't as smart as us or lack some sort of emotional intelligence or some other right facet of human intelligence. So what that boils down to is sort of a, just a technological problem, right? It seems like if the programming gets better, then maybe they can have the emotional intelligence. Maybe they can make these more contextual decisions. 
the authors argue that at best, these sort of de deontological arguments could be sufficient to ban all AWSs for the time being, but it's certainly conceivable that one day they could meet the standards um, of being able to make these decisions in a justified and moral way. Um, and also, not every situation is so subtle and tricky, right? There's lots of situations where it's clear cut, in which case it would seem that these deontological arguments would have to say, sure, go ahead, use AWSs, right? If there's no chance of having to make some subtle, contextual, emotionally laden moral decision. Um, and, right, these accountability gap issues only arise when a war crime occurs. Um, there's lots of situations where you, it, there's not much chance, if any, of, of a war crime occurring, like, for example, um, in non-lethal applications or when autonomous weapon systems are fighting each other or right, destroying infrastructure. So it's not going to be, these considerations are not going to be sufficient for a blanket ban on AWSs. At best, it would be a, for the time being, ban on sort of interactions between AWSs with humans in situations where the considerations get tricky, for, like likely when civilians are around. Okay, so what about then the consequentialist approach, right, to banning AWSs? Um, you certainly will end up with different answers, right? So uh, you might end up, again, you're just adding up pros and cons, right? how much utility is created by using the AWSs, right? How much pain and suffering is created by using them? And if the balance is in favor of the pros, then use them. If it's in favor of the cons, then don't use them. Uh, so totally different approach, right, than the deontological approach. Um, so you could see that, you know, if you add them up, it, you may end up saying, okay, well, AWSs are um, not okay to use against humans, but they're fine on uninhabited buildings. Um, you're going to have to sort of base your judgment on expected outcomes, right? Um, they are thinking maybe it'll favor a rule consequentialist approach, which we've discussed. It was a while back, right? But instead of running the utilitarian calculus on every single action, you instead run it on general rules, right? And you say, okay, this general rule is going to produce the most pleasure and the least pain, so everyone follow those rules. Um, so that seems, at any rate, like the best approach. If you're if you're shooting for a blanket ban on AWS, that's right. You you could have some sort of utilitarian rule that says, oh, this would the rule of no AWSs if followed in general would on the whole create the most pleasure in the least. Um, there's going to be narrow views and wide views of what consequences count, right? Again, that's often the the trick of utilitarianism is like, okay, there's a lot of consequences. How how far in the future? How how far do we trace this causal chain, right? When we're adding this up. So a narrow view would maybe only consider the results on the batter, battlefield. Um, a wider view might also consider larger geo consequences, um, like deterrence effects, arms race, general destabilization, maybe even nuclear war becomes more potentially on the table if fewer of the combatants are human, right? Um, so now, Naturally, it makes sense that if you were trying to defend AWSs, you might only you might want to stick to the narrow consequences and just talk about, you know, what happens in the battlefield. And the idea is, well, if more machines are doing the fighting, um, that means fewer casualties on both sides. First of all, because more machines, less humans. And second of all, the machines are really accurate, right? So um, more accurate than humans. Uh, and so they're not going to be have to kill as many people. Right? Um, but in the wide view, you might worry that countries and other actors might be more inclined to start wars if they're less costly in terms of human life, right? Um, we see this now, really, in, in the United States, um, if you, you know, compared to World War II, Vietnam, right? The, the U.S. body counts in, our, in the wars we've been involved since then have been much, much lower. And it seems like the public has much more tolerance for these sort of endless wars in the Middle East than they, than they did in Vietnam where lots and lots of U.S. soldiers were getting killed. Um, uh, AWSs might be able to take out an opponent's nuclear capabilities before they can use them, right? Which would um, then bring an end to the sort of stalemate. So one theory on why the U.S. and Russia never blew each other up is because there was mutually assured destruction, right? We Both countries had enough nukes to destroy the whole world like 10 times over or whatever. So neither one wanted to use them because there's no 
there's no winning that that war right but if you could use an aws to take out your opponent's nuclear capabilities then you could launch nukes on them and win the war right so that that could be bad right we would rather nobody launches any nukes if um so the authors do think there is a, at least on the on the wide view an argument that uh aws would be a bad thing right calculus would end up heavier in the in the cons column but like the deontological arguments there are some limitations of the consequentialist arguments um so some of the bad consequences particularly in the wide view would uh, would follow from AWS's falling into the hands of states that are more willing to use them and, and use them to accelerate again the, the uh, wars and you could counter this by more enforcement right on who gets to use them um, it doesn't seem to be a problem these consequentialist arguments if you're only using AWS's for defensive objectives right that that would seem less likely to encourage aggressive first strike um, so again Certainly, there are pretty good deontological and consequentialist arguments against AWSs in different ways, but neither one gives these authors what they want, which is a blanket ban on all AWS. So uh, they suggest a confluence model, right? So they want to say they think the deontological arguments in general are better suited for blanket ban, right? Because they are these unbreakable moral rules, right? It makes sense. Um, in international law, it does tend to favor these sort of human rights considerations over doing the consequentialist calculus. So um, they want to start with the deontological. This will, in the context of international law, that's where we start. Those are going to take precedence. So they call this the prioritization of deontology. Anytime deontological considerations come down against AWS, then they trump whatever consequentialist considerations there are. So you've got a deontologist saying, no, uh, this system right will uh, violate right A, and the consequential says, yeah, but you know it's going to have good consequences. They're saying always go with the deontologist in those situations. A right could be violated. That's it. No AWSs. Um, but they say since the deontological approach is limited, in those situations where the deontological rules are not applicable then you can come in with your consequentialist concerns and hopefully those then will block AWS's in leftover situations. So I think it's easily to, easy to conceive of situations where neither could block them all. They've pretty much argued to that effect, but they think this, anyway, even if you can't get a blanket ban in all situations, that seems your best bet to getting the, the least amount of situations where AWS's are allowed. 